that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell, the famous Tom Fennell. In the flesh. And the infamous George Harvey. In the flesh. Okay. <laughs> Every week we get together and have the best of the blog, the blog being geoharvey.wordpress.com, where I do my daily posting of energy and climate change news, about 10 to 15 items a day, and we do about 20 or 22 items a week that we consider the most interesting and uh, get going under that. You can visit that at geoharvey, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y, dot wordpress dot com. And uh, we'll just start off Thursday, September 17th. How about that? You got something interesting? That's the first one. You do. <clears throat> this is from ReNews. Offshore wind installation vessel Pacific Osprey has installed the 100th pile installation at Northland Power's 600 megawatt Gemini, Gemini offshore wind project. The 161 meter six-legged jackup is pushing on uh, to pushing on to complete work at the project lo located in the Dutch, Dutch North Sea. Sorry for spilling my words all over the place. Two substations and the first transition pieces are in place, and what you see on the screen is a little bitty boat putting a little <laughs> bitty substation on a little bitty set of pilings. I think that that set of yellow pilings down there is probably about eight stories tall. Probably. At least. I think the ship is probably six stories tall. I, you, I guess you maybe. You can't the, get an impression of how large that barge or ship, it's really a ship, is. Oh, yeah. Without a reference. With a, there's not much reference there's there. There's a couple of things up there that look like uh, shipping containers. Yes. <laughs> that, and they probably are. They probably like are. That. That's right. Yeah. And you don't notice it, but there is a huge crane that is between those two bigger cranes. Yeah, there is. The yellow one. Yep. Yeah. And it's like there's a heliport on top of that building that they're hoisting into place, which I figure is probably six or eight stories on top of the eight or ten story pilings. This thing is not small. This is small. Very, big, very large. <laughs> yeah, it's very big. You would not fit that in your backyard unless you've got one heck of a backyard. And you can see all those yellow things that look like buoys in the background. Yep. They are the pedestals for the turbines that will be installed next. Yes, they are. And there's a lot of them. A lot of them. Well, this is a big project. It's a 600 600 megawatt project and interestingly enough the the capacity factor of this thing is probably around 0.5 you know they're getting 0.6 capacity higher than that because think so the, the north sea is always wind yeah, yeah and 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 the the work they've done on wind turbines is such that uh they're just getting more and more efficient yeah so the 600 megawatts would probably produce about half the power um, annually than a 600 megawatt nuclear power plant would. Um, anyway, that is from uh, Renews. Our next item is from Clean Technica. A report looks at whether coal from two sources would be sold at all without subsidies. It concludes that significant subsidies backing the production of coal in Australia and the Powder River Basin of the U.S. are, quote, distorting the market, driving up emissions, and acting as a barrier to entry of cleaner energy solutions, uh, sources, end I don't quote. think too many, too many Americans realize how dependent the energy industry is on, on coal, coal from the Powder River Basin. Yeah, well. That's what that map is showing. The map there, is showing crazy. the connection of the Powder River Basin with the places where the coal is exactly, used. Exactly, exactly. And um, the, it's used all over the place, mostly in the eastern half of the United States. This is all uh, open pit mining back there. It's not on yeah, the ground mining. We've seen some pictures of open, open pit mining that are unbelievable. Yeah. And, you know, just to give you an idea, I read about an open pit mine in Germany, and you think of Europe as being high-priced real estate, an open pit mine near the Polish border, and they are, they are removing three villages that were built in the Middle Ages. 
and additional villages and farms and so forth as well. The mine will be a hole in the ground twice the size of Manhattan Island. Wow. And they're pulling lignite out of the ground, which is... Which is brown coal, dirty, dirty Dirty stuff. coal. And it's, you know, it's just... And they're not using it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually they are for, for some of it. I don't know that they're going to use the coal from the new mine in themselves, but they're getting away from coal in Germany pretty fast. Um, I don't know, maybe they're going to sell it to the Ukraine so that they can replace the g natural gas the Russians won't give them or something. I don't know. Something like that. Something so. like that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Hard to keep up. Um, our next item from Electric Co-op today, a 52 megawatt battery system being developed by Solar City in Ho Hawaii. That's my, what my mother taught me to say. Hawaii. Uh -huh. uh, will be adjacent to one of the Kauai Island uh, utility cooperatives. I actually looked up those glottal stops just to make sure I got them. <laughs> <laughs> you remember Arthur Godfrey? Oh, I sure do. He was talking one time about being in Hawaii. Yeah. And he said, I stopped the native. I asked him, is it Hawaii or Hawaii? And the guy says, Hawaii. I said, thank you. And he said, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's a 52 megawatt battery system in the Kauai Island Utility Cooperatives consisting of tw 12 megawatt solar fields. Under a 20-year contract purchase agreement with Solar City, the co-op will pay 14.5 cents per kilowatt hour for battery storage power, primarily using KIUC's evening peak hour uh, demand hours. Now, I should point out that 14.5 cents is m perhaps a third of the retail price of electricity in that area. And this yeah, is, it probably is. Yeah. This is coming in at the highest price uh, dem demand time of day. So this is probably a money-saving deal. It's a good for deal them. for the utility. Yeah. Take a look at that uh, field on the left there. That's, yep. That's a, that's a very large solar project. Yep. And I think, uh, I'm guessing, but I think I'm guessing well, those little white square th or rectangular things there are the battery systems that you see to the right. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. But if they are, that's a big field. It's a big field. We know it's a big <laughs> field. So we're not going to complain about that. Okay, we're up to sep uh, September 18th, which is Friday, and from The Guardian we got this. Toyota now collects more than 90% of the nickel metal hydride batteries used in its hybrid cars and is aiming for 100%. But what happens to the batteries after they're collected? Well, some are recycled, but from an environmental perspective, it's even better if they are reused. They have a second life at Yellowstone Park. Now, they're going to have a second life at a lot of places because when one of those batteries is replaced, it still has about 70% of its, of its life utility. Yeah, it's no longer useful it. for its original purpose when right. you're driving a car because right. it, it doesn't there's hold a, its charge long enough. Yeah, there's a degradation. But for this purpose, it's perfect. Yeah. And so um, it, 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 what it means is that when you turn in a battery for, for a car, when the car gets old, uh, or the battery gets old, and get a new battery, you should be getting a pretty good uh, uh, a pretty good refund on it because, th because these things are valuable. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the trends seems to be that they're leasing the batteries. Yes, indeed, so they, that's they are. So going to be an automatic turnover. That's to, right. To keep your battery two years, we give you a new one. I gave you a, a I, I, I was considering buying a smart car, one of those little two-seater. Yeah, you told me about it. Interesting car. It's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Yeah. I don't know how they do I that. I don't know. <laughs> those servers are pretty good. <laughs> They're really smart. And that's from Mercedes. They have, you, you can buy the car for like $13,000, and and, but... Not buy the battery. You lease the battery. You lease the battery. And it's like eighty dollars yeah. a week or a hundred dollars. I mean, a month or a hundred dollars a month. Trying out or new something. models, different models. Yeah, yeah and some and got to click. Yeah, and that it gives the person who's buying the car an advantage because he doesn't have to worry about the health of the battery. And also, it means that when the battery starts to get old, he may be able to upgrade inexpensively to a battery with a longer range. So if you think about it, maybe that car gets old better as it gets older. <laughs> well, that's what we're looking at. Yeah, I suppose. Okay. Mercedes does make cars that last a long time. Yes, they do. In fact, the first Mercedes <laughs> is still around, getting its second life as a uh, museum piece. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess.
Okay. That was from The Guardian, and our next item is also from The Guardian. The Mayor of London reminded cabinet Lord ministers, Mayor Lord Mayor of London, <laughs> uh, Boris Johnson. If Typical I re- English name. Yeah, right. <laughs> As I remember it, uh, that's the, that's an, it isn't in front of me. Reminded cabinet ministers that 10,000 local jobs were dependent on the renewable power technology, uh, which had, in his view, many, many attractions. The warning from the high-profile conservative came as the chief executive of Shell predicted uh, solar would be the backbone of our energy system. And there you see it, folks. Solar panels on houses in London. Yeah, why not? It's interesting. This guy's a Tory, and the Tories are kind of fighting solar power and any well, kind of, any kind of renewable. Well, we're going to see some strange things about Britain and, and renewable power and uh, I mean, it's in this show. Well, there's a new guy in Britain, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. He's okay. out of power now, but yeah. he probably will get into power next spring, and uh, things are going to change. They may change. Okay. He's to the left of Bernie Sanders. Is he really? <laughs> what a stunning event. And Bernie Sanders might be to the right of Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> really? Yeah. Guys, yeah. if you think I'm kidding about this, go to Wikipedia. Look at Bull Moose Party, which is Roosevelt's party, and in there you'll find the party platform of the party that that backed the, this guy who the conservatives think is so great. And you read that and tell me if Bernie Sanders would have wouldn't have been <laughs> right on board with that. <laughs> okay. Moving along. Yes, moving along. Thank you, Tom. Ne- uh, Clean Technica tells us the Department of Transportation in Washington, and you're going to cur- you're going to point out. I know. Washington so I'm gonna, State. Yeah. Oh, I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> Wrapped up a bid proposal for over 800 electric buses in 12 different locations. BYD Buses w- has been given an award for 10 of those categories. The contract may be the biggest in U.S. history. It includes buses from 30 to 60 feet in length for highway and intracity applications. B-Y-D. Have well, you was, ever heard of them? Yeah, I was reading about them in the article. I never heard of them before. They're yeah. the largest manufacturer of electric buses in the world. Yeah, and one of the largest or possibly the largest manufacturer of buses, period. Yeah, they're They're, they're, they're big. A this is a big outfit. But they and have one, themselves cleverly concealed in China. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things they're doing, which is very, very clever, they're making buses, I don't know if these are or not, with... Wireless en route charging. Yes. When they stop to take on and off passengers, they're stopping over a device that recharges their batteries. I wonder what that does to, well, human beings, but also to the things that people carry in their pockets, like little computers and phones and things. Do you think the magnetic... Well, I think if they're standing on top of that thing, they might be in trouble. <laughs> Maybe you could recharge your nails, cell phone in a couple of seconds. If they got nails in their shoes, they may not be able to walk away. Yeah, right. <laughs> Saturday, September 19th, we got this from CNN. Everybody trusts CNN. The summer of 2015 is Earth's hottest on record. The meteorological summer of June, July, August saw its gr- highest global average temperatures since records began in 1880, according to NOAA. Um, Those, oh, good for you. Those record highs occurred at the surface of both land and sea. Scientists had predicted a record-breaking summer based on modeling, and I will want to point out, the summer of 2015 was the hottest on record. The second hottest on record was the summer. 2014. You got it right there. And this year we got to deal with El Nino. El Nino, yes. And Which is a little map of what happens to the waters around in North America. Yeah, that's not an actual area. picture of the color of the waters. Oh, it's not? <laughs> <laughs> the reddest ones are hottest. The and, hottest, And yep. the green ones are the coldest. There's blue also, but it's not on the picture. And that's false colors Hudson's that are being Bay put up. Blue. Oh, is it really? Oh, good. I'm glad you noticed that. <laughs> yeah, Hudson's Bay, you'd be blue if you were in Hudson's Bay. I think so. Yeah. I tried. I wanted to drive up there one time, and I found out there's no roads. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I wouldn't have a road if I, <laughs> if I were you know, Ontario or Quebec, not to Hudson's Bay. But you know, they've been talking about putting big power plants up there um, to supply New York. Wouldn't be surprised. But they got transmission, of yeah, transmission lines. Just put in transmission lines. Okay, should we go on? I think so. Okay, Energy Manager Today 
says the USE, I'm sorry, the USDOE, collaborating with the National Institute of Building Sciences, has officially defined zero energy buildings, which are also referred to as net zero or zero net energy buildings. The definition extends to communities, campuses, and portfolios. The published guidelines for measure, they published guidelines for measurement and implementation. And I should, I should mention what this means and talk about what this means. A zero net energy building is a building that produces as much energy as it consumes. Or more. Or more. And, and that includes grounds around it. So if you've got a building with solar in the backyard, that's, that could be. It could very well could be. be. Yep. And the, the first thing that you do is, you know, Stephen Strong came to, to um, Brattleboro and talked. We talked about that in our last show. And he said the way you get, you know, to a really a zero net energy building is you use efficiency first. The second thing that you do is use efficiency. Ah. And the third thing is use efficiency. And the fourth <laughs> thing is use efficiency. The fifth thing is use efficiency also. But the sixth thing is seal it up well. <laughs> yeah, very, very high yeah. insulation. Yeah, really, right? you've got to have, well, air infiltration. And along about the end of that thing, you get to a point where your body heat and the, the, the kettle of tea and things like that that you produce in the house, uh, well, the I'm heat just, coming off from your LED light bulbs, you I know. I was just going to mention that. I've yeah. got a friend who lives in a hay bale house. Yeah. And uh, she'll heat her house making her morning tea. Yep. You know, it takes the chill right off the whole place. Absolutely. It's amazing. Yeah. And uh, at the very end of the thing, you can turn that to zero net energy very easily just by putting a few solar panels up and throwing a switch. Uh, the, the solar that, that is used is uh, the icing on the cake, but really it's not that big a deal. And another thing. The, the technology exists the already. Te it's technology. It's applying it. The cost of building a new building, everybody who wants to build a house should understand this. The cost of building a new building that is 90% of the way to passive, and by passive I mean you don't use any fuel. You may have a wood stove for, for emergency backup in mm -hmm. case you've got a horrible cold time with no sunshine and so forth in the winter. But the, the, the way to get, um, if, to 90% of the way to zero net, uh, to um, passive, which means that you use 10% of the fuel, which means that you spend 10% of the money on fuel, is the, a building built to that standard is about the same price as a conventional building now. That's not widely known. No, it's not. And people should understand that. Um, you, you can, you can, the reason is because the extra insulation and the extra care for ceiling costs about the same as the furnace and the chimney. And so <clears throat> you put in a, a heat pump, you know, just for regular use, maybe a wood stove for an, a, a terrible emergency, put up some solar and you, you're, you can be just zero that. net energy pretty fast and that really cuts your costs a lot. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that is, um, brings us to Sunday, September 20th. It is not clear, this is from Morning Ticker, it is not clear where the idea of global warming hiatus originally came from. Maybe we'll find out later in the show. But over the uh, last several years, it is a widely held idea. Now, two papers by different groups of researchers show there has not been any pause in global warming. NASA says 2015 will likely break 2014's record as the warmest ever recorded. And you know, the first time I ever heard about that hiatus, yeah. I looked at the graph and I said, they're using Something this here, huh? to prove that there's a hiatus? Are you kidding me? <laughs> because, you know, it's kind of like saying, well, the, 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 the temperatures in, in 2095 were warmer than the temperatures in 2001, so obviously global warming has gone on vacation. Must be. Must be. be. It's like saying they went to the South Pole. they're making the assumption yeah. that if we don't get a new record every year, year after year, then obviously we aren't warming up. And we unfortunately have been breaking records. Got a nice picture a on lot. the screen. That's that's a thunderstorm over Melbourne, Australia. Oh, cool! Now I think that's a multiple exposure. It's I would be, I would bet know, it but is. It's still a very spectacular picture. It sure is. It's a very spectacular. You know what that reminds me of? I used to live in Winchester, New Hampshire, on a mountaintop, 
and we, from where I was, I could I could see over Northfield, Massachusetts. Okay. And one day I saw a, a thundercloud up over the over Northfield, and it would glow just every few seconds, every couple of seconds, it, you'd see this thing glow because there was was a lightning strike somewhere okay. inside. Yeah. It was, I guess it was. But the thing that was really bizarre about this, I was at an altitude probably 600 feet above Northfield. The top of that cloud couldn't have been two or 300 feet higher than I was, more than that. Uh -huh. And above it, the sky was blue. Yeah. And it was getting on toward um, sunset. And above that cloud was the moon. And oh, there were- Oh, beautiful sight. Oh, there were beauti <laughs> beautiful, <laughs> short blue sparks jumping upward like they were reaching toward the moon. <laughs> amazing sight, absolutely amazing. I wish I could have photographed it. I'd never heard of anything like that. I've heard of it since uh, from, from sources, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, show up in the press very much. I don't think many people are all that interested. <laughs> if I wrote a poem about it, maybe they'd care. Okay, now this next one is a bit of a problem. That's all over the news. From Bloomberg, it didn't add up. VW cars were spewing harmful exhaust when testers drove them on the road, but in the lab they were fine. Discrepancies in European tests on diesel models of the VW Passat, Jetta, and BMW X5 last year gave Peter Mock an idea. He checked the cars. VW had a cheat device on them. And what it, and VW admitted this. They, oh, yeah. they put cheating software into 500,000 cars that were sold in the United States so that the cars could detect whether they were being tested in a lab and if they were, reduce the NOx uh, emissions that they were, they were producing. And the, on the road they found they were as much as 40 times as high as the legal limit. This is the fluke. I mean, they spent a lot of Woo. money developing this. So. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. But you know, they sold 11 million of these cars worldwide. And they're taking all of them back, aren't they? I Whether think so. And not. you know, th there are countries in this world that I think may be drooling as they look at what's happening in the United States. Because in the United States, the EPA is saying, we may go after this company for a fine for $37,500 for every single car. That's 18 billion bucks. Um, that's, that's Trump change. <laughs> not, no, I'm sorry. Not, not to VW, it isn't. VW lost $20 billion in its, in its um, uh, market value. The stock value. In two days yeah, over I, this. I heard that. Which brought their... their about a third of their total value. Right. It brought their gone. market value down by about the amount, a little bit over the amount of the fine that may be level, levied. Fine? I got news for you. They've lost... They've lost in uh, customer confidence. They've, yep. They're going to be fined in the United States. Yep. They're going to be fined in, in, in Canada, the UK, India, every, Italy. Everybody is looking at and these the cars. Class action suits are forming, class action suits. forming as we speak. They could easily face lawsuit, damage, fines, you name it, that exceeds their market value. I think so. I think that the VW of the future is going to look very different than the VW of the You mean the, 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 the company. company? Well, my suspicion is that VW is going to be, um, th there's, a, there's a fairly strong chance that their stock value is going to go to zero and they will declare bankruptcy and wind up being a possession of the, of the creditors. Th it could be that bad. It could happen. I mean, yeah. this, this, this is pretty darn big. Yeah, I mean, that's I mean, what happened what to I Kmart, and they is, didn't even do that. I, I can't <laughs> believe how stupid they were, thinking they could get away with it. Well, you know, this is what happens when you have, when you have very aggressive, intelligent people uh, who take over huge uh, um, industries and governments. You've got people who <clears throat> think they can get away with things, and we've seen it happen over and over and over again. But this also is basically kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, according to an article that I did not reference in, in the stuff that we've got today, the um, folks at Clean Technica did a, a little bit of research. They got a hold of somebody who had been in, an EPA inspector, mm -hmm. and the person said, 
finding cheat devices is just part of the job. This was a cheat device that was sufficiently well designed that they were able to get away with it. But he said... Um, so you're telling me this, this kind of behavior is commonplace? It's commonplace. He said that it had been done by Chrysler, GM, and Ford, and they had been caught and fined, but the fines were low because they hadn't released a whole bunch of cars. But it had been done by basically every auto manufacturer except the ones in Japan. That's what he said. Well, that's an interesting statement. It isn't it. Yeah, it's a it's a uh, it's kind of scary. We're going to get back to this. Yeah, we will. Um, it's all over the news. I mean, you it, can't hear anything. Yeah. But these yeah. Days. Okay. The and, the and the CEO who said he wasn't going to resign just resigned. Yes, and the price of the stock went up. But you know what? I think that's just smoke. We have uh, people are going to go to jail for this one. I think. I think they will. And as a matter of fact, when you think about it, Rico, we're going to be talking about it. They yeah. can be they can be prosecuted for every sale. Yeah. How would you like to be prosecuted for 500,000 instances of fraud? I wouldn't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> Neither no, would I. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> All right. The Australian Financial Review says Denmark is preparing what may be the biggest IPO in the nation's history as it sets up the sale of the state utility Dong Energy. You know what Dong well, means. It's, it's, I thought it was a Chinese company. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, it's yeah. Danish oil and natural gas. Okay. Dong. okay. All right. The government is uh, giving itself a maximum of 18 months, the company, which comprises units of oil, gas, wind parks, distribution networks, could be worth as much as $11 billion. And I'm sure the Danish government would just love to have $11 billion extra. What's well, interesting there going to be selling this company, but they're only going to sell half of it. Because the government's going to re retain control. Do you know, are they going to sell half of it for $11 billion, or are they going to sell half of an $11 billion company? <laughs> that I don't know. Yeah, it's <laughs> kind of unclear in this particular article. Yeah, I, don't, I can't get it out of that. But it's going to go up for auction, and uh, whatever happens, happens. That's what happens. Okay, or should we move on? Well, it's just a nice picture there. I'll nice picture there. Again. It's a nice picture of the uh, dong uh, of the North A North Sea uh, wind installation. Right, right. Lined up like soldiers. We're lined up like soldiers. There they are. Let's move along. Okie dokie. Um, Greenpeace International sent us a thing saying Greenpeace working in collaboration with the German Aerospace Center, and you know as I think. I've been saying sent us this. Yeah, it sent us this. It sent everybody this. I just happened to find it in the pile. <laughs> Greenpeace sent us this, working in collaboration with German Aerospace Center, issued a report saying 100% renewable power can be achieved by 2050. And not only is this transition possible, but it will create jobs and is cost competitive with the necessary investment more than covered by the savings in future fuel costs. This picture up on the screen, that really blows my mind. That's a ski area. Yeah. You can in the see Alps. off on the right is some of the, some yeah. of the slopes, and this is one of the slopes. Yeah. And it's an unknown ski area. It's not, you know, Gestad or one of the famous ones. Yeah. This is just a, a neighborhood ski area in Germany. Neighborhood, yeah. That's right. That's what they do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know where they don't have mountains? You know what they have instead? They have neighborhood ski areas where people go out and cross-country ski. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Those racks. A go, go, pictures here. Yeah, go up again a little bit because I want to mention the racks. Those racks are uh, avalanche control units, and they are four avalanches that would be moving down that slope from north to south, and they're setting up solar panels on the south sides of the those. sides that they're not using to stop an avalanche. Yeah. Yeah. This is, you know, there you go. <laughs> okay. And you wanted to show I some other pictures. I just wanted to show some there. of the, the pictures came out of the I love that little picture of kids lined up yeah, in the shade of the solar panels. And I hope somebody has given enough thought to that to make sure they don't get into trouble down there. <laughs> I don't want to see them getting shocked. <laughs> okay. All right. So we should go on, I guess. I think so. Energy Ma Matters sent us this great article. Wasn't it nice of them? LG Chemicals. The, one of the world's largest lithium-ion battery manufacturers has supplied a one megawatt, two megawatt hour energy storage system for a solar power station in Cedartown, Georgia. 
a Southern Company and Electric Power Research Institute initiative. The project is evaluating grid impacts of energy storage system. So it's a pilot plant. It's a pilot plant. It's a two megawatt hour pilot plant. Now I'm looking at that logo. <clears throat> you know, LG, they make telephones. They do. But uh, apparently they're a lot bigger than that. I think they made, I think they made mine. But yeah, they made mine. Okay. They make a good phone. Yeah. Life is good. That's what LG stands for. Life is good. Life is good. Well, I'm glad you told me that. I would have thought it was lithium ion something. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Well, according to this article, they started producing lithium ion batteries in 1999. Wow. Which they probably may started making them for the phones. I would guess. But uh, a big battery can just be an accumulation of a lot of small batteries. Well, you know, it was. It, it, I remember reading about a or seeing on television something about a car that broke the the world. Uh, land speed record as an electric vehicle and what they did because you have to dro drive out and then back and what they did was they drove out and then they changed the battery pack and drove, drove back, back. <laughs> and the battery pack consisted of some huge number of d-cell batteries <laughs> d-cell batteries yeah no kidding. that's right wow. <laughs> that's what they had <laughs> Alrighty. okay our next item comes from vtdigger.org it's also in the uh, reformer. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, uh, the commons. The commons, in yes. This week's commons. That's right. A Vernon, Vermont, in Vernon, Vermont, a town hit hard by the shutdown of Vermont Yankee, officials say a natural gas plant may be in the works. The optimism in Ver Vernon is carefully qualified because the plant is far from a sure bet, and it's not been disclosed which sites are under consideration. Development costs are estimated at $750 million, and I think that would provide more than three or four construction jobs locally. Well, there's a couple of things going on here. Yeah. First of all, there is an opportunity to make money existing in Vernon with right. the switchyard. Oh yeah, absolutely. You got a capability of injecting uh, maybe as much as two gigawatts of electricity into the grid at that point. Right. It was originally designed for I think two Yankee plants. I believe it was. So it's big. It's big. And you got to believe that people with money are looking at this as a possibility. Yeah. Well, this is you know it reminds me a little bit of that thing that Google did where they took a a um, <clears throat> coal burning plant that was going out of business and turned it into a data center. Now the electricity yeah. was flowing in the opposite direction, yeah. but nevertheless they had a grid connection there which was a really, really big connection. And, and a data center takes a lot of juice. It does, like as much as a good sized town. The the thing in, in Vermont Yankee is they've got that very valuable piece of, piece of infrastructure there. Which doesn't even belong to Yankee. Yeah, that's right. And all it's doing right now is supplying power from the dam to the rest of the grid, as yeah. far as I know. Yeah, I think birds are roosting on it. I, want, I think they <laughs> might be. I, I wonder what other kinds of facilities could go in there besides, um, besides natural gas, because well, this they, depends on a natural gas pipeline being which, built. Which, yeah, if you look up there, there's a circle on there. Yep. That circle in, is depicting the natural gas pipeline right. that they're fighting over. Yep. And you go down through New Hath Northampton, about every other house has a sign in front of it, no, no natural gas pipeline. Well, people are upset about natural gas pipelines, and for more than one reason. Well, in, in, uh, North ha in Northfield, uh, there's going to be a pump station, which apparently is noisy. Oh, good. <laughs> that seems to be the biggest thing. But if that pipeline doesn't, doesn't happen, the natural gas in Vernon is an, is an old Well, one. yeah, it's not going to happen, at least not at that scale. that they use biomass. They could use as, biomass. As they could we have spoken, there's clean biomass and there's dirty biomass. Yes. And I think, well, the dirty biomass is the cheapest way to go. You know, it's an interesting thing as I think about it. If you're doing coal, uh, wood gasification or, mm -hmm. or just general biomass gasification, it could be from it's cleaner. waste. Um, it could be waste product. Waste food. What your what your and bio digesters exactly yep. waste yep. food, you could you, you could truck waste food to places that are are near Vernon for example and have small natural gas natural gas pipelines, or you could just have a natural gas facility in Vernon that depends upon large bio digesters down there. That would be feasible. I mean there was a there was a thing where they were going to spend two hundred and seventy five million dollars 
on a biodigester that would that would service hotels and restaurants in London. Now I realize that they don't have that kind of hotel in London, <laughs> you know, in, uh, size of things in Vernon. But my recollection is that there's a lot of dairy farms in that area, and that would be right a source. Right across from this location is a very nice large dairy farm, right? Miller farm. Yeah. Yeah. And and between solid uh, restaurant waste and food waste stuff like that that could be trucked in and has to be disposed of anyway. Side, railroad There's a railroad right siding shore. so you could bring waste down from as far as Burlington and from as far south as Northampton and or, bring them or further. I mean, that's, bring that's, them, that's where Amtrak goes. Yeah, you could bring it on that track. You could, yes. fa the fact of the matter is you could bring waste from Boston because Montreal. there's there's a, yeah, Montreal. There's a track that goes east to Boston, which yeah. doesn't get used very much, but it, it is used for freight. And if you had huge biodigesters down there, you could have a fairly good-sized natural gas plant. Well, I would bet money that eventually somebody is going to take advantage of that, and something, something. will be built there. Yes, yeah, something. What it's going to be... Maybe it'll be an em energy amplifier. Yeah, that might be. And for anybody who doesn't know what an en energy amplifier is, it's a thing You're that... You're going to tell them. It, it chews up nuclear waste and spits it out and when it spits it out it's it's got no long-term well we had a guy here in this show talking we did about it. and if you want to you can go to bctv.org uh, brattleboro tv.org is the, the address and you can look up energy week uh, and and put put in ones. rucroft in there r e u c r o f t and that'll get you to a couple of shows that we had about energy amplifiers and you can learn all about it yeah, Rucroft is a physicist. Who, who is a group leader at CERN. at CERN. Yep. So and this guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah, it's and the person show. who invented the energy amplifier was Carlo Rubia, who won a Nobel Prize and also worked at CERN, which huh. is how Steve Rucroft knew him. Okay, we should be moving on. Moving on. Okay, uh, Times of Malta. And every time I hit that name, I think <laughs> about this time spent in a soda, at a soda fountain. <laughs> Major nations seem to be reducing fossil fuel su subsidies but still have, quote, ample scope, end quote, for deeper cuts in, re in recent support of up to $200 billion a year. The economic, I'm sorry, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development says the OECD nations are estimated to subsidize fossil fuels productions of 160 to 200 billion dollars annually and that does not even include the subsidies that are done in other countries and OECD is about 30 countries. This this picture came from the article and I'm fascinated by it. It's it's a very primitive old-fashioned steam engine yep. and they're loading coal in a very primitive old-fashioned way. <laughs> Which was very primitively old-fashionedly mined coal. Yeah. Well, look at the coal. It's, that was hand-dug coal. It's, you know, machine-dug coal, all the coal would be uniform. This is, you know, okay. dug by somebody with a pick and shovel. So they employed a lot of people to get the... the and those look to me like they're small steam engines. They well, may certainly be the one in the front is. I mean, narrow it, gauge. That, that's a hopper in the back. It doesn't even carry... Not very tender. big. That's no, right. It's, it, that, so I'm sure, was designed for use in a yard moving... moving yeah, and it around. might be some guy with a shovel keeping the, the engine stoked, or it might oh, be sure. might be an auger. That's possible, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, some guy just turns a crank. <laughs> yeah. You I'm employ a squirrel. Is, where is that? You know, is that in Malta? Is that in it, India? It, who knows? It could be in either. It could be someplace else. People still use steam engines today. Yeah, Mount Washington. That's true. And you can go up on the Cog Railway, and it's a wonderful experience. And if you do, and you are careful to look at what you're going over, you'll see that the whole <laughs> track is a toxic waste dump. It is, yeah. But, you know, years of toxic waste. 100 years of toxic waste. And it's, um, I don't know, I don't know. The problem with that, by the way, is not the coal the pro so much. Oh, coal, in my, in my estimation, is a... Is it's a, grease and stuff, right? It's grease from yeah. the cog system falling down cups. over the year. <laughs> over the years, the, the grease from the cogs to, to lubricate the cog railroad has fallen down on the ground, and there's a hundred-year accumulation of it under there. Anyway, that was Times Multi. Bloomberg, we're back to VW. Bloom, Bloomberg says VW AG plans to set aside 6.5 billion euros, which is about 7.3 billion dollars, in the third quarter. 
third quarter to cover the cost of addressing irregularities. Isn't that a cute word? In, in uh, diesel <laughs> engines, irregularities. <laughs> Cheating in diesel engines installed in 11 million vehicles worldwide. As the scandal that started in the U.S. widens, Germany, France, South Korea, Italy, India have all said they're looking into the issue. My, my thing here in front of me doesn't say India, but I know that it is because I saw it someplace else. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. This is going to be a big, big problem. Well, very definitely. Yeah. It's kind of sad. I always liked VW. I did too. I drove VWs. I drove bugs. Yeah, I had many bugs. Bugs and, and uh, buses. Bugs and buses. Yeah. I only I only had bugs. They were great cars. It was amazing what you could do in a VW bug in snow. And they, they just were not stopped by snow. Yeah, they they, they, they worked pretty well. I drove over a I drove over a mountain at midnight every night. Uh huh. In all weather conditions in a VW, I never had trouble getting over that mountain. That was uh -huh. a steep mountain. Uh -huh. I mean, there was a hairpin turn on it, where. Every once in a while, I'd see a school bus or a tractor trailer or something lying on its side. No kidding. The school oh bus, fortunately, had no, nobody on it, but the in it, but the driver when it fell over. But this was a this was a steep mountain, and my VW just whew, over the top. There you go. Okay, our next item, and this is important, came from Clean Technica. <clears throat> Tesla will drive down battery pack level uh, costs by seventy percent which is down to around $38 per kilowatt hour once the Gigafactory hits productions via economics of scale, improved chemistry, supply chain optimization, and other fa fa factors, according to Jeffrey's analyst Dan Dolev. Moder Model S battery cells could be brought down to $88 per kilowatt hour. Now, just that so... That has no meaning to me. Explain it a little yeah, bit Yeah, just so people know. $38 per kilowatt hour. A kilowatt hour, you might use, in an average family, you might use 20 a day, 20 kilowatt hours. This means that you would be able to store a day's supply of electricity for under $800 Okay. for a, for a family. That's a pretty good investment. You put, a, you put four or five uh, uh, kilowatts of solar power on your roof or in your yard, and you've got a system there that would keep you going. You or know, you can buy power when it's cheap at night. That's right. Save it. And that's use right. It during the day. This <laughs> is this is really the, the, uh, it's part of this is this is the future. This is the future. The thirty-eight dollars per kilowatt hour. A kilowatt hour of electricity costs fifteen cents. A kilowatt hour storage system for a battery costs a lot more. So this is uh, what I've read is that two hundred dollars per kilowatt hour is disruptive to the utilities. This is thirty-eight. This is so a what you, big what deal. What you told me the other day is that thirty-eight dollars per kilowatt hour is the size of the the bottle. It's the, the bottle, yeah. The thirty-eight dollars. Not the liquid that's in it. That's right. Yeah. It's like thirty-eight dollars per kilowatt hour for the battery. Buying a battery is like buying a a, a jug. Buying electricity is like buying the water for, that, that yeah, goes yeah. into the jug. Hey, uh, take a quick look at this this factory. Oh. That is nothing but huge. Yeah. This, they call it a gigafactory, and they don't call it a gigafactory for nothing. Yes, that's right. That's about a mile long. A mile long. And it's it's not rectangular, as you might get the impression. It's, it's shaped like an arrow or a... Uh, diamond? Diamond. Diamond, yeah. yeah. It's, gonna, it's going to uh, employ over 6,000 people. Yep. So it's, from what I read in a, another article, its output is already taken for the first year and a half. So what are they going to do about that? <laughs> They're going to build another, another one. Another <laughs> one right next to it. They're going to have a city out there in the desert that never was there because they've got employment. Now, what I'm going to do here, Tom, I'm going to read the next three articles, one right after another, and then we'll do the three, do the three together. Okay, we can do that. This is Wednesday, September thir uh, 23rd. Climate change denial has been compared to Big Tobacco's 50-year campaign to deny the dangers of cigarettes. It's not widely known, but that what that ended what ended the Big Tobacco campaign was actual prosecution under the RICO racketeering statute. Now, a group of scientists wants to use RICO against climate deceivers. This is from red, blue and green. The next item on this 
Clean Technica said Inside Climate News has a series about Exxon quietly studying fossil fuels and global warming. They found that in 1978, Exxon's own scientists were telling the company that oil and gas use contribute to global warming and would play havoc on the cl uh, planet's climate. Exxon then funded politically motivated de uh, climate denialism. I would say not politically, so this, possibly this could be another sleeper that we're going to be hearing. This about. is not a sleeper, I don't think. I think this is going to be a woo. It's yeah, a sleeper, I suppose. It's not really in, big in the news. The yeah. final thing from Green Tech Lead, Energy Watch Group, and La Pinatra University of of Technology in Finland, have published a report that claims that the International Energy Agency has been holding back global energy transition for years. The EWGLUT says false predictions in the WEO reports have led to high investments in fossil and nuclear power sections. Now, I want to point out here, we're dealing with two separate issues, but they have a similar effect. One of them is bad data, and it's not just the International Energy Agency, it is also the uh, Energy Information Administration in the United States. And the guidelines they set up. And the guidelines they set up. They have been told how to make their, their projections of energy usage, and they do it according to that, that mm -hmm. system. The problem is the projections are, the system produces bad results, consistently bad results. I've been watching this thing for years, Every year they say, this is what solar and this is what wind are going to be like in 25 years. And the targets that they set for 25 years hence are met the following year. Mm -hmm. The one time that they didn't do that, the targets had already been met when they re released their projections. <laughs> they were, and, and by the way, according to a different agency in the US DOE. So this is interagency things going on. These projections as regards to, to uh, renewable energy are just plain wrong, consistently wrong. And the, part of the reason is because the change is happening so fast they can't keep track of it. And just to give so you an example. It's not even deceptive. It's no, deceptive. there's nothing deceptive about that at all. It, yeah. it's, it's just... They're just doing it wrong. They're just doing it wrong. And give you an example, a, a really powerful example. A year ago, they said, well, we finally got to the point that we've got a, a gigawatt, um, uh, 1% of the uh, electric capacity in the United States is solar. Okay, 1% of the electric capacity is solar. The problem is that they had failed to count 40% of the electric capacity because it was on people's rooftops. And they don't <laughs> count things on people's rooftops. In fact, they didn't count anything. And for some of their practice, they, they would only count in, um, generating facilities if they produced more than five, uh, if their capacity was more than five um, megawatts. And the aggregate of all the small ones is bigger than... Yeah, that meant that there wasn't a single fo solar system in Vermont that could be counted. <laughs> okay. So all these things you see out there on farmers, they don't, fields, exist. They don't <laughs> even exist, you know. And, and it, it's like Vermont Yankee closed and a few years before Vermont Yankee closed, Vermont stopped buying power from Vermont Yankee. But before that, we got about a third of our power from Vermont Yankee. And what had happened was that um, we had a program called Speed Program. And I'm told, by the way, you know, that was changed to Reset. But name, they've yeah. changed the name back to Speed Have again. Really? That's, oh. I've read that. I don't know that it's true. But um, the Speed Program... The Vermont Yankee sold a third of its power in Vermont yeah. at one time. And now, one time it was owned by the Vermont utility. Yeah, but mo most of the electricity was sold outside mm -hmm. the state. The speed program has already replaced 50% of the power that Vermont Yankee supplied to, to the, Vermont. the state of Vermont. Yeah. And the speed program is still going strong. And what I'm saying is it's not going to be that long before we get all of the power that we ever got from Vermont Yankee out of the variety of sources we get from speed. S small rooftop, small utility scale, um, uh, solar systems, solar bio systems digesters. Are in, in Brattleboro, all yeah, over the place. Bio digesters, um, biomass, like they have in, 
is it Rutland or Burlington that they have? Burlington, the, Burlington. Electric is biomass, and, and it's then very well done. Hydropower plants. We've got hydro. We got two hydropower plants in Wyndham County alone that are coming online. Why? Not because new dams are being built, but because the dams that were dams already are there. there are are having turbines installed. I mean, this is we're we're in a different age, and none of this stuff is being counted toward toward renewable because it's all too small by the just, Energy Information just Administration. It's a different age. It's a different age. So what's happening is we're moving to distributed power. We're moving to small power plants. We're mo moving to personal power. People owning their own power plants. You know, and yeah. it's a different system. Now that's what's happening. That is not deception. It's just bad estimating practice. This other stuff, Exxon, I read, you know, I did a, I did a thing where I went into an article and I, I looked at the, sor at the references that the article was referencing and I looked at some of the references that they were referencing and I came across the most cute little article. It was very funny. This little girl who was 11 years old had built a grade school science project for the grade school science fair. Uh -huh. And it won the first place in the uh -huh. science fair. And it was, you know, two little systems, one of which had carbon dioxide in it and the other didn't. And she turned on a light bulb and one of them got warmer than the other. The one with carbon dioxide got warmer than the other. Isn't that cute? Isn't that interesting? And so she demonstrated <laughs> climate change and the motive, the, the, what was behind climate change. The thing that's most interesting about this is not that an 11 year old girl did it. But where did you get the information that said you could do that? You're going to tell us. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> she got it from her father, who is a climate scientist working for Exxon. Isn't that interesting? Now, <laughs> notice I said Exxon, not Exxon Mobil. Correct. So it's this, way long ago. This happened in 1981, folks. This happened in 1981. Yeah. Exxon knew, yep. and they paid for bad science to fool people, to defraud people, in order to maintain their profits. And guess what? That is fraud. It is. Yeah. Good rant, by the way. And, <laughs> and when you're doing that over and over and over again, you can get prosecuted under the RICO Act. Well, I'll bring that up again. Well, that's... let's look at the RICO Act. This has been going on for years and years and years. And what is the RICO Act? The RICO Act says that if you have committed an act in violation, and there's certain kinds of laws, they can be state laws or federal laws, but they are laws um, that are specified in the act, and fraud is one of them. Mm -hmm. And fraud means that you've done something deceptive in order to get money. Now, financing deceptive science or pseudoscience in order to maintain profits is, in my opinion, fraud. And that means that if they're doing this year after year, it is subject to RICO viola uh, Act charges, and that means they can go to jail. Well, and one in of fact, the people that's fighting for this to happen is Sheldon Whitehouse, who's right. a senator from Rhode Island. Rhode Island, yes. And he wrote a book. He wrote a letter about it, and this just blows my mind. He talks about the Big Tobacco Playbook. Yeah, it looks something like this. One. Pay scientists to produce studies defending your product. Right. Two, develop an intricate web of PR experts and front groups to spread doubt about the real science. Could I point out, by the way, that there is a thing called the State uh, Policy Network, which is doing exactly that? Yeah. They are taking bad science, which, which disagrees, by the way, with almost everybody who is in climate science. And we, they have been seen to be doing this. MSNBC wanted to look and, and find out who were the 97% of scientists who were saying that climate change was happening and the 3% who weren't. Because this figure, 97%, had been kicking around for years. So MSNBC went out and they surveyed almost 70,000 scientists. And how many of them do you suppose said climate change is not happening? It was a very small number. I'll bet you can remember. <laughs> <laughs> was it four? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I've said this before. I'm, gonna, I'm undoubtedly going to say it again so many times that people are going to get sick of hearing it. 
if I went out talking to physicists and I, and I asked a question, I would expect more than four positive answers if the question was, is it true that you believe that you are the reincarnation of Isaac Newton? <laughs> four people out of 70,000? That's consensus, folks. Barack Obama wasn't kidding. This is not a, so, a socialist uh, a plot to defraud uh, democracies into, into, into integrating all of the democracies into Soviet socialism. This is a plot, yeah, and it's happening really, really clearly. The, the um, uh, uh, Freedom Partners has said, oh, we're going to put almost a hundred billion dollars into science projects that are going to be convincing people that climate change is not happening and also by the way making sure that our people get into the congress and the pres and the white house in the next election which happened okay what are we saying here we're saying gang let's let's you know people let's look and see what's going on yes climate change is real yes there are a bunch of people who have got a lot of money that they're going to lose, $100 trillion, to, according to Citigroup, in, in uh, uh, stranded assets. They're going to lose a lot of money, and that money is, uh, the, uh, that those groups are going to lose is being defended by the groups. And these, these are groups are fossil fuel companies, which are probably a third of the largest companies in the world. The 22 largest fossil fuel companies have, have revenues that are about uh, twice the... U.S. national budget, about eight times the budget of the Defense <laughs> Department. And these people are going to lose a lot of money if that stranded assets, if well, the stranded assets you know, stay in the ground. I don't really believe they're totally stranded assets. They're still eventually going to be used, but I don't in a think different so. manner. Well, maybe in a very different manner. Yeah. Yeah, lubricating the cracks so the earthquakes aren't as bad. I don't know. Well, <laughs> 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 in the Early half of the last century, most of the gas that came, that people used, was, came from coal. Yes, that's right. And some so, of it came from wood. And some of it came from wood, and, you know, every little town had a gas works. That's right. You know, and we And by turning well down the gas a little bit in your house every day and saying, no, 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 it's not getting darker in here, that's called gaslighting. <laughs> <laughs> well, stuff Ingrid like that can come around again. I don't think they're going to completely gaslight. Wipe <laughs> well, not gaslight, no, but oh. using, using coal and biomass to generate electricity and stuff like that. You know, in I, different ways. honestly, Tom, I think that coal is going to be banned altogether. The, the mining of coal will be banned altogether, except to get fossils out of the ground so that you can display them in, in schools and libraries. <laughs> That's and a possibility, too. And I, I think just can't see these people taking it laying down. I, I don't. It's they're not taking longer. it laying down. But the point is, the money is traveling from the fossil fuel companies. They are acknowledging, that is definitely happening acknowledging now. the fact that they are putting that into political campaigns and what they call science, which denies what almost a hundred percent of scientists are saying. This is all. What they're saying is almost like going to people and saying. Six is the same as seven. You've got seven dollars. If you give me one, you're going to have the same amount. Yeah, right. I mean, really, this is like scientific version of three-card Monty. It's, <laughs> it's like, what are we doing? And they're defrauding people. I have absolutely no question about that. They are, in my opinion, absolutely defrauding people. And they're using their money to buy what? Politicians. The Congress, they've said, our, our, we're, we're after the Congress and, and what are they doing to get away with this? Well, they've got a lot of credit build up with the Republicans and, the, and right-wing politicians in the United States. And they are saying, well, these people are on our side. They must be right. Mm -hmm. This is, this, I'm sorry. This you is, know, in, in a sense, this is just a different version of what Volkswagen's doing. Yes, it is. That's right. <laughs> We've seen a lot of lying and a lot of deceit laid on the table in the last week. And I believe we are running out of time, Tom, so... I think we are. Folks, rant on. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good week. Have a good week. Bye-bye. It makes the wind blow strong as it will I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so love
lovely earth can stay lovely still.